I'll have a test for you. Let's get into these two chapters that are vascular and immunity. I already recorded the second part of this lecture. It's already up there. So we're doing the second half first. Uh, and this is the, the first half of this. So know your heart, PCG, blood pressure, diseases. Uh, yeah, everything that I uh, that I covered. Sample questions are up there, practice tests, and then, uh, I think I may make another review lecture. I had a request for that, so I'm gonna want to listen to that. Once again, but you know what to expect. So this chapter, obviously very uh, apropos and uh, having a major pandemic going on at the moment. Uh, but indeed, some of the coolest things like immunology, the whole class is made very, very interesting uh, parts. I'm impressed with those people that are that smart to know about all these T cells and B cells and CDA and CD4, all these cells and such. Uh, I like bigger things like uh, but, um, pretty much when you look at this, uh, you have wounds in your body all the time. And this, this world is filled with all kinds of bad guys. I say bad guys, it's so wrong. I have to stop myself. Um, it's easy to think of disease as being the, the antagonist, the bad guy, you know, but it's just another organism just like you. You looking for cheeseburgers and mating with your uh, mates, and uh, they're just looking for hosts to live, and they just want to survive and produce, and it happens to be what they do. So, okay, some of the bad guys, but the world is filled with a lot of other players, and a lot of bacteria and viruses and worms and protozoans that love to live inside of you and steal your nutrients, and. Uh, Use you to pass on the babies. But we notice if you guys get a wound, it, it uh, might get infected, or it might hurt, but it gets better. It heals and it comes back almost good as new. You might have a scar or stuff like that. And so people, even with these diseases, they're sneezing and coughing and they feel like crap, but they come back, you know, and you and you you heal from this, you fight it off. It's so so cool. And then, of course, the amazing thing is that many diseases get them, and if you survive, you never get it again, even though you're surrounded by that disease. So that is the cool adaptive immunity that I'll lecture on in the next lecture. Uh, but that is so cool. I have it on lymph nodes, B cells and T cells. I remember 30, 40 years ago, oh God, who knows, but, but I had chicken pox, and uh, if I ever expose to it again, uh, I will really quickly neutralize that sucker, and I won't even get sick. You know? But that first time, I sucked. So. This ability to uh, to do this, and we fool it with vaccines. We kind of get the disease, we don't get the disease, but we uh, are exposed to that pathogen. And we'll do that. So this is a yeah, cool observation about our immune system. In a mammal, it's highly evolved and it's adaptive immune system where we can specifically make antibodies, and make cell to cell combat in a specific way, like getting a fever, getting and getting the neutrophils, eating the bad guys. That is just. Uh, and everyone has that, bugs can do that. But we have this ability to recognize disease, 
for the business and come back and fight them. All right, so um, indeed, so we're in a pandemic. So uh, as I mentioned, another thing about diseases is that there's very few diseases that are so deadly they kill you right away. Like you might like a bowl or something like that. They're very rare because diseases don't want to kill you. <laughs> they want to keep you alive and sick and coughing and diarrheaing and, and spreading the copies of themselves. So they love it when you're sick and you're, when you're not sick enough. You're sick enough to walk around and spread it. I say that, you know, bacteria doesn't have a brain. So that evolution is going to head that direction. Diseases want to keep you spreading more copies. But the only way they persist is if they find more hosts. If they're not a host, the disease dies out. There's got to be some kind of reservoir host so disease can take off. So smallpox is is a horrible killer, but now it's eradicated completely because we vaccinate everybody, we have every so there's, there's no place for it to go, and it's no longer a disease. Other diseases that we have hang out because there's always these new fresh meat for the disease that are uh, that can be spread. All right, so I just want to briefly talk about, about COVID. Uh, um, Indeed. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, um, of course, half a million people have died so far from COVID in the U.S. only, like two million in the whole world. It's just a quick little, see if it works. Yeah, and this was, um, yeah, this is, of course, only went to like last year. We're just showing you the spread of the disease. Now, um, is this going to spread through uh, droplets and through on, on surfaces? And you just see how scary that is. And, of course, that's just a little bit. It went on and on. Uh, we happen to be in a time here, we live in, um, we live in Maine, first of all, which is nice. Our uh, university can be open. Um, but Maine and Vermont doing really well. I mean, there are places in the country that are not. Um, but uh, just so you know, viruses, uh, what they do is they, they can't reproduce on their own. They have to, they need a host cell to reproduce. And so a virus will find a host cell in this case, it's enveloped within it. Sometimes it just lands on the surface and injects its genetic material, maybe a couple of enzymes. And then it causes the host cell. Once there's like a message on there, messenger RNA, it just stupidly copies it and makes stuff. So it, it causes the host cell to make copies of itself. And it organizes these little viral particles. And they're just, one of the cell grows big and then explodes, releasing all those viruses. So sometimes it just, Leads them out like this. And so, pretty smart. The viruses, they can't reproduce on their own. They need a host cell. So, that's why, you know, are they live? You know, it's kind of like the edge there. In the case of uh, SARS CoV 2, it's got these spike proteins on it, and it can, it's only going to, uh, to go on certain cells, and it will uh, hijack the cell to make more copies of the cell. And what makes it so deadly, it gets into the respiratory system and uh, it causes really big inflammation of uh, and debris to fill the lungs. And that's you know, a big killer. Although it also affects uh, other organs, blood clotting, brain, we think. We don't know. It's only been a year, so we don't know all the effects. But the main effect is respiratory. Um, and so the next lecture, I, I'll talk more about this. But what happens is that your immune system will, will, uh, will ingest some of these viral particles because they're. they're they don't belong there. They, they obviously are there. And then we'll see, we call these antigen presenting cells. An antigen is any kind of foreign material. So it's going to present it on its surface. Like, look what I found, this little piece of virus, this spike protein. And then you're going to see these lymphocytes are going to get excited, the ones that, are, that match that. Oh my God, I'm the COVID lymphocyte that they've been waiting for. And uh, they will go crazy and buy. And then this B cells will make tons of antibodies, like a thousand per second. And the antibodies, they match the spike proteins. So any viruses in your system, the antibodies will glom onto them and neutralize them. And then the T cells, they're kind of more cell to cell combat. Again, this is next lecture. But they'll come up to a virus infected cell and destroy it. And so this is your immune system working to kind of clear this virus and get it out of there. And there are viruses that they take their uh, genetic material and they put it right into your DNA. Oh my God, that's scary. Here's my DNA in my cells. And I have that chicken box virus. It's like in my DNA, right? So my neurons and my, my spinal cord. And uh, it just can wait there. I might, I might die with it. Or it may wake up sometime, turn into shingles. So viruses, in this case, uh, from Iran, but um, sometimes the, the viruses get right into your DNA and they splice it and they put themselves right in there. 
All right, so, um, and again, this is uh, this is data from China, so I don't believe as much as CDC. Actually, I did the CDC more in the last month than I did. But this is showing, of course, you know that a lot of people, people in this room have COVID and no symptoms. Yes, they have a lot of that. But then, of course, um, you know, as you get old, some of the older people and some people with especially pre existing things, they get very, very sick and die. I mean, we have half a million people, more than a little more, more has died because of this. Much more can be much more potentially dangerous than any you know cold and normal flu, of course. And so I just I made this I fixed this this morning to make sure the Johnson and Johnson vaccine on there. Um, I was lucky enough that I have my, my first Pfizer. I'll get the second one. Lucky enough to do that. Um, and in May they just came out with how they're going to do it by age. So if you're in your 60s this month and the 50s and you guys will be with some or something like that. Uh, the ability to get this vaccine. If you want to get to the people, most likely to die. To get it, and for frontline workers too, yeah. those hospital people uh, got it first. But these vaccines, you can see um, the, the effectiveness. That's the effectiveness of, of you not getting of getting really sick and dying. But there's a lot we don't know. We don't know how long the protection is going to be. We just don't know. Um, we don't know really if. It, Maybe you, you can get infected, but these, you know we don't get sick and die because the, the data is from tens of thousands of people. We know that these effectiveness means you're not going to get really sick. But um, we don't know a lot still about this. Definitely. And um, the Johnson and Johnson, you see it's less effective, but it only takes one dose. It doesn't have to be treated so so preciously, like the Pfizer has to be like negative hundreds of degrees. And uh, basically, just so you know, I'm going to talk about vaccines in the next lecture. But um, in the old days, the vaccine, we would take uh, this virus or bacteria, you would take a dead version of it or a weakened version of it or a piece of it and put it in a syringe. And then we inject it in you, and then your immune system recognizes it as foreign, takes all these antibodies and memory cells so that next time you won't, you won't get sick when you encounter it. Now, this is cool as mRNA vaccine. Forget that, it doesn't put the little spike proteins in you. It puts the freaking recipe, your DNA, to make it. And so it puts that messenger RNA, the message, into your cells of your muscle, these little particles. And then uh, your, your, your cells ingest it. And then they start making those spike proteins. And the spike proteins are made in your cells. And then you recognize, the immune system recognizes those spike proteins as being foreign. And it makes a response. They make B cells and T cells and memory cells. And so you get kind of a booster on that. And then uh, in the future, when you get anything with a spike protein, you're ready to just glom down and make anybody just wash everybody in the mouth and you don't even get sick. So that's an mRNA uh, vaccine. Relatively new. Uh, it's, uh, in the old days, most vaccines, they just gave you like polio, like a dead version of the cell. They, they killed it and they did it. You know? In this case, they just, you've learned to take the recipe to make one of the proteins on the surface, give it to you, and then your body makes the protein. It gets rid of it like within 20 hours. It doesn't do anything with spike proteins, but it's enough time for those spike proteins to make your body say, oh shit, it's not me. Attack it, and then you'll make uh, these B cells and T cells. That's pretty, pretty fun. Uh, and so looking at the people say, oh, it's been so 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 fast, you know, and then they, they worry that you know it's been sped up and corners are cut. You know, all the, the trials have been. Have been done with the amount of people they normally do for vaccines. It's just that we had, um, we're getting better at this, and we started manufacturing before we finished the testing so that we were ready once it had passed if we had all this vaccine ready. And mRNA vaccines, you can make them quicker than our traditional vaccine. Yeah, and so, um, oh yeah, I've talked too much about this, but uh, some people like, yeah, I couldn't wait to get the vaccine, excited to do that. Other people say, I'll never get this vaccine because it has. Mercury in it, it's going to cause uh, infertility. It's going to, we don't know enough, all this stuff. We don't know what's in it. We know what's in it. It doesn't cause infertility, all these things. But a lot of people are kind of in the middle of this confusion. I just want the vaccine or not. Some people are, are yeah, doing crazy stuff to try to get it. And other people still, even the EMPs and stuff, so they're not going to get it. So you guys out there might be anyone that's confused. Oh, that's my quick little my quick little thing there. All right, so uh, mRNA vaccine uh, that's a, that's a cool way to do it. Instead of giving you a piece, you give it the recipe. Your body makes it. Yeah. 
Okay. I didn't have any issue. Lindsay got the Moderna, and the second one should really sick after the second one. But I'll let you know next week. Yep. All right, so. Uh, immune system again. We're talking about there's really like several levels of your of your of your uh, security system. The first level is just having skin, having skin, having acid in your stomach, having salty skin, having tears with enzymes. So there's this kind of barrier that you have. Now we never see innate. Innate means you're born with it. So this is uh these are not specific to any disease, but it's just any foreign invader you're ready to protect. Uh, Neutrophils, macrophages, they see something important, they eat it, they kill it, turn the pus. Having a fever, you know, having skin, these are all innate. You're born with it, there's nothing like really specific about it. So it's very fast, very general. And then the cool thing is this acquired or adaptive immunity. And that's what I'll spend time next lecture talking about how you remember specific diseases. Whew. And how important it is not to recognize yourself as being foreign, but the autoimmune disease. Lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, MS, these things are where your body attacks itself. The immune system, the immune system goes wild when you have allergies or asthma, things like that too. So it's a tricky thing. You, know, you want to recognize the bad guys at the same time. You don't want to overreact to your normal. Uh, the first before I get to uh, into this, uh, this um, chapter talks about immunity and the lymphatic system. So this is going to be much quicker than cardiovascular, respiratory, skeletal system. The, immune, the lymphatic system is going to be these little microscopic lymphatic vessels, and then this watery fluid in them. And it's a way we take extra fluid in our tissues, extra fluid that came out of your blood that has to make its way back to the blood, and it goes to these little tubes. No heart pumping in, nothing like that. It just slowly makes its way. And of course, you have lymph nodes that can filter. The lymph nodes that you have in your armpit, your neck, your heart, they're going to filter this fluid that can wash over your cells. And they can find bacteria, they can find bacteria. And then all this excess fluid that comes out of your capillaries is going to be collected by lymph vessels, filtered by lymph nodes, and eventually it dumps back into your veins just before the heart. That water goes back into your body. But it took a long time to get through this lymphatic system. During that time, your body can sample it, look for bacteria, or viruses, debris, or anything that wants to get rid of. So your nodes are like a filter. Indeed, they're spongy and they cause the fluid to go through these nooks and crannies, and it's like maze. So once the water has to get through that maze, it gives the time in here for all these. Lymphocytes and immune cells to, to sample it, to look for it. If that COVID uh, virus comes by and it recognizes it, it can, that's going to be the first step in the immune response to that virus. So these lymph nodes are a good spot for you guys to uh, surveil for uh, intruders. And we'll talk about the spleen too, the spleen is the part. All right. And then uh, there's another thing that you need to know is that lymph vessels are also how we absorb fats. So uh, digestive system we'll see in our intestines, uh, they have a hard time absorbing fats because fat doesn't dissolve in the water. So uh, it turns out these special lymph vessels will absorb fat in your gut. And then you have this water. So what would happen if a lymph vessel was blocked off, like in my armpit? It would be a small process, but my arm would start swelling. I'd have edema. So the excess water couldn't be drained. So it's going to drain the excess water. At the same time, it's going to surveil for pathogens. And then it's also in your gut used to uh, absorb fats. Again, I like this schematic diagram. We spent you know, a lot of time talking about the hearts, the blood pressure, and how it pushes water out of the capillaries and as most of the sucks back in, but there's always excess fluid, a little extra. And that's going to get picked up, I'll show you, by these lip vessels. These are dead end vessels. They're like hard or like two ends, just like the empty cul-de-sac. But they'll pick up extra water. And it'll slowly make its way back into the bloodstream. Your whole body has lymph vessels, not your brain, but everything else has lymph vessels in your body.
So the green here are those little, little, this little capillaries. So again, dead end. The dead end, they're not like the arteries have, you know, is a continuous circuit, right? These are just dead end um, vessels. And there's no pumping part. So the fluid just goes in there by pressure. And then it's moved by your muscles moving and breathing. And just kind of slowly that water gets back to your blood. You look a little more closely at these guys. Uh, and they have valves in them, very important, because otherwise the water wouldn't go back to the heart. It, it would keep going back and forth as you exercise. So especially when you guys exercise, you're really moving your muscles and your breathing is really heavy. It really moves that limb. When you're laying there, it moves very slowly. When you exercise, it's a pushback. And these valves keep it going back towards the blood. So you squeeze it with the muscles, and then the lymph gets squeezed forward, you can't go back. So it kind of ratchets its way back. But like a vessel, we'll have an endothelial lining. Whatever little muscle kind of pulses, some of them pulse a little bit, um, but not much. Else. Yeah, it just kind of shows it. So it's uh, they're really kind of wimpy, and and the the cells on the outside kind of overlap like this. So the deal is that there's the pressure is higher out here, like the water pressure. It's going to be forced into these lymph vessels, and then it's going to be kept in there and keep going that direction because of these valves. So it's really kind of a passive process where, where excess fluid finds its way in these. But once it's in there, it just keeps going back towards the heart. So it's excess fluid is carried away. And anatomically, uh, they're all over your body, these lymph, uh, little, little vessels, but there's two big collecting ducts. And the, the right lymphatic duct will do your, your right arm and the right side of your head. And the thoracic duct goes up your, your thorax, it goes behind your guts, behind your diaphragm, behind your, your heart, and it's going to drain most of the body. Both of these drain into the uh, major vessels of the, uh, of the heart. Now, one thing about these lymph vessels, okay, this reminds me of breast cancer, is that these uh, lymph vessels and lymph nodes can carry cancerous cells, right? So cancer can travel in the bloodstream and metastasize the heart, or if you go in the lymph system, so for breast cancer, they look in the lymph nodes in your armpit. So you know generally that flows towards there. So we can we're kind of sentinel. We see if, they, if, if they're here, it means they've spread, and maybe they even spread through. The lymph nodes are often biopsy to see how cancer has spread because it will spread in that in the fluid. These big circular things be the lymph nodes. Those are really big. You can see how the little tubes of the other lymph vessels. So they're microscopic and then they get bigger and bigger. This thoracic duct you can see in that section of the cadaver. You can see the little blood tubes kind of out. Oh, I got to show it here. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's been colorized the other one. But so there's a tube you find behind the heart on top of the uh, next to the aorta, big white thing the aorta. It's a little wimpy little tube. That's the yeah, thoracic duct. They do chest surgery if they nick that and they don't realize it. There'd be no problem at first. Then the patient will slowly be leaking fluid and fluid will start building their chest and it's like, oh, why is there fluid? And they realize, oh yeah, we can cut that duct. We can do it. It. So it's a very slow process. It's not like hitting an artery. It's just gonna leak out slowly. So this is carrying all the lymph from your legs and your groin. All the way up. Eventually, again, yeah, your whole body decides that right arm and it's A lymph is just extracellular fluid. We just call it lymph when we get to the lymph vessels. So it'll be mostly water, small proteins, uh, anything that dissolves in the water. Uh, beautiful. We're showing a showing lymph vessel. So here's this extracellular fluid. And the pressure gets higher out here, it'll just move into this vessel and it'll find its way out. And again, you need to know the term edema. Edema means when you have water that swells your uh, tissues. Talked about that a lot. Heart failure, the edema or pulmonary edema when water gets into your lungs. So it's not 
famous the lymphatic system you know you don't notice it unless something goes wrong and it rarely does but a uh, lymph nodes are spaces of course important for your immune system and uh I'll talk about your spleen here but they're so necessary to get rid of excess fluid yeah. here's my slide on lacteals well they're called lacteals here it is lacteal like milk so within each one of these little fingers in your small intestine that we'll see that absorb nutrients, all the sugars and all the amino acids go in the bloodstream, but the fats go into the lacteal, into this lymphatic vessel, it's in every one of the little fingers that's in your intestines. Remember my anatomy teacher back when I, I took this, talked about how an experiment, you take a cat and feed it just a bunch of fat. They love it, you know, a bunch of fat. And then, um, oh, um, the cat ends up deceased, right? And then you uh, dissect it. If you look at it and you see in the mesentery of the intestines these white streaks. So you can see how that fat being absorbed. Yeah. I don't want to belabor the point, but here, here's a lymphatic vessel. And you can see it's kind of tethered to the cells around it so it doesn't collapse. But it's all about, it's all about pressure. So, slight difference. A little more pressure in the water and the tissues is going to force it into the to the uh, lymph vessel, and then your muscles breathing will help kind of a little bit of contraction will help bring, bring that water back into the body. Yeah, this is how it moves because you don't have a heart, there's no heart lymph system. So you can see uh, uh, it's mainly again being active, being active because they have valves in it, just like those veins getting blood back to your heart. It's the muscles trying to feed them, and then the valves keep going in one direction. Valves incredibly important. Some of them have a little muscle in it, but breathing and moving your muscles. You guys remember how breathing is going to help bring blood back to your heart? Because right? so when you breathe, your diaphragm pushes down in your guts. So that pressure increases in your intestines, which is your abdomen, and it makes a suction to my chest. And that's going to help bubble the blood back up. So every breath helps bring blood and lymph up into your uh, thorax. Why is a disease? Elephantitis, of course. Uh, some uh, horrific um, pictures you can see. Sometimes the testes get like the size of like basketballs, you know, and that's kind of famously. But usually you see it in the lens, and it affects hundreds of millions of people in parts of the world where you see this more tropical areas. And it's a, it's a worm, a nematode roundworm. It's carried by mosquitoes, and uh, there's all kinds of worms that. Some of the eyeballs and skin. But this one lives in a lymph vessel. These worms, and they'll block them up, they'll block up the lymph vessel. And so this leg can't drain. The excess fluid is chronically edematous. And they chronically has edema. And then you'll even get the skin will get, to show a picture, yeah, kind of like elephant like. The skin kind of turns up. Yeah, so that's one problem with the lymph nodes. You can also, if you have, like I said, surgery, let's say you have a removed for breast cancer, like a lymph node, and the lymph vessel um, is uh, uh, is cut off, you'll have a tissue swelling in the chest region there because that fluid can't drain. So you don't notice a problem with your lymph vessels until one is blocked off or cut off, stuff like that. And elephantitis is worms living in your chest. Okay. All right, so going back to uh, to our white blood cells, you know, the lymphocytes were the second most common, right? Neutrophils, most common lymphocytes. So that's what they look like. And it's small, the huge nucleus. And I told you they're going to be important. They're going to be your B cells and T cells. It's so cool with the ability to have memories and recognize pathogens. So, so. A pathogen is any disease causing or like throw a pathogen, it can be virus, bacteria, or so these guys recognize uh, foreign things, not only pathogens, but toxins, fallacy, them, not organs, but they recognize it as being different kinds. So these lymphocytes, when we see them in the blood, you guys saw them in the lab, they're just traveling in the blood. They're not doing anything in the blood. They're going to leave the blood. They're on their way to your lymph nodes, or your spleen, or your tonsils, or your appendix. So when we see them, the second most common in the blood, they're just going somewhere. They're going somewhere, we caught them on the way somewhere. They're going to go into your tissues and they're going to sit usually in wait. They're going to sample the environment 
And we're going to see there's millions of varieties of these, and each one has a unique signature on it. So when you get a new novel disease for you, it's going to uh, match one of these millions of varieties, and it's going to get excited, it's going to wake up, and make the antibodies do their thing. So they look kind of boring here, but uh, they're actually they're all really different. And uh, Sean is looking for a different signature on a different uh, So your lymph nodes, and this will be a lot of swollen glands. It's often this, you'll feel a lot in the neck. So if you have a respiratory infection, uh, you know, it's usually you know, sinuses, these ones have become swollen. There was an article saying people are going for more mammograms. I think they have uh, more breast cancer false positives because the COVID vaccine gets your, your lymph nodes swollen. I feel a lot, but it's really just because your body's reacting to the, uh, to the Later, it's a good thing. But so these lymph nodes, they're found, I think they have how many? About 500, 600. They're usually less than an inch long, they kind of shape like a bean. And during dissection, you find them in the fat in your armpits, in your elbow, in your neck, and along your trachea. So they're found throughout the body, and they're going to filter that lymph. And by filter, I mean there's macrophages that get debris. So if there's broken off pieces, um, they'll catch them and eat them. But they also surveil if there's any uh, bacteria or viruses or anything like that. So all the fluid has to go through these lymph nodes slowly, and it gives it a great chance for those lymphocytes to be in contact with anything that's new. So that's the big deal. I mean, they'll filter just like a Brita filter filters your water. But they're also surveilling the environment for anything that's new. Here's a picture of one. Kind of ugly, but it's bean shaped. And you'll, you'll see these in dissection. Looks like it's almost like fat, but then you'll feel it's kind of solid, and that'll be these lymph nodes. And you all know lots in your armpits, you know, on your jaw. All right, the anatomy of the lymph node. All right, important here. You can see you have uh, uh, vessels coming in and then a vessel leaving it down here. Um, you guys learned in organs called the hilum or hilus. This is where arteries and veins and things leave. Hilum. I don't know if I talked about that yet. Between the lung, the liver, the spleen, now the hilum, it's like this region here. And so the ones that bring fluid to it are called afferent. Remember, A comes before E. So if I ask you which vessel enters the lymph node, afferent or efferent, they go A comes before E. So afferents are going to bring it in, just like your nerves, afferent, the center, your nerve. So afferents bring it in. And then there's going to be like a little space under the capsule. And like the capsule on the outside, all the capsule around it, is going to come in and these little walls. And the fluid comes in on one end, maybe eight grand, and it's filled with fluid, water from your tissues. And then it's gonna like like a Plinko machine, it's gonna slowly make its way down do, 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 until it comes out here, and it's gonna keep it going on its way back to the blood, that water. But the water has been filtered. And these little things here are they're filled with these B cells. Uh, and if you get sick, your lymph nodes can enlarge really big because these will start dividing, dividing, making more and more of these. To get a vaccine, these will get big because you're making these B cells and T cells to make antibodies and uh, fight the infection. Here's a bigger picture. So, again, afferents come in, there's a capsule around it, and there's little walls that come in like that. Uh, little, little watery space, and then the water is forced to go through a circuitous path to make it down to the leaves at the high level. And if you have see the blood vessels coming in, they're going to bring those B cells. You're going to get off here, it's like the bus stop. You're going to come in the blood, like oh here I go, and get off, right? And other ones will get on, go in the vein, go out, and stuff. Here's a lymph node. Again, cancer support. Cancer cells can metastasize and they can start growing your lymph nodes. It's a good way to catch where it's going because we know generally the direction. And that lymph getting back to your heart goes through several groups of lymph nodes. And so it's like one after another, but I find that water gets back to the blood, it's going to filter. Yes. Here's a yeah. All right, so the lymphatic capillaries I talked about, and then the afferents go into the lymph node, the afferent leaves it. Then we had two big collecting ducts, the right and thoracic duct, that'll bring back into the veins, in the blood. The water gets back into the blood. All right, 
All right, so where do you find lymph nodes? Uh, you guys kind of know, but they're found in the, the places in your body like where things come into it. So your groin and your armpits are like the gateways from your limbs, right? So if you have an infection with thumb, you'll feel the lymph nodes in your elbow or your armpit will get big. If you have a sinus infection, the ones in your neck will get big. And they get big because they're interested in dividing and making more, more cells to help fight that infection. Yeah, there's a whole bunch um, along right next to your, uh, your lungs. There's all that crap that you breathe in your lungs goes into there. Um, behind the elbow, you'll see some kids get inflamed ones there. Yeah, but mostly I think armpit, axillary, uh, inguinal or groin region, and then you look for ones along your neck, trying behind your ears. And again, I've already told you this, but it is a nice filter. And it has that immune surveillance. It's a great spot. Because all that water that washes over your cells, that could hold bad guys. You could bring it back to you. Um, let's see. I'll tell you the thymus. The, the, the thymus is really big when you're a fetus and as a kid for adolescence. And then it gets turns into fat, it's smaller and smaller. By the time you dissect the cadaver in gross anatomy, it's barely noticeable from fat. So fat doesn't do it. So your immunity really goes down when you get really old. I'll say that when you get older. Because the thymus is going to where T cells mature. T cells have a leukocyte. So T cell means thymus derived leukocyte. So the thymus is a gland that is going to take those T cells that are naive. They come, they're made in your bone marrow. They come to the thymus to grow up. And if they're in the thymus, they test them. If they recognize self, any of Jeff's molecules, they are killed, they are out, right? Because that would be an autoimmune kind of thing. But if they don't recognize self, they don't recognize different foreigners, then um, they are allowed to, uh, to leave the thymus, go out into your lymph nodes, and into the body. So it's where the, the T cells mature, where you can test them, find out they do not recognize self. And they'll be more, yeah, I don't know. So the thymus is huge uh, when you're little. You guys affected a fetal pig in whatever. The thymus was big. The thyroid is in the neck, right? The thymus was real big in the fetal pig. You get an adult pig in the neck. Yep. And even Galen noticed that it got smaller. Older, he was wrong about a lot of things. <laughs> you see it's big in a fetus and it gets really small. It's, it's right above your great muscles of your heart. So we put your pet in it. All right, so don't, don't confuse thymus with thyroid, completely different. And this just shows you T cells come out of your bone marrow naive, and then your thymus is where they're going to mature, and they'll come out ready to go. This is your T cells. Your B cells come out of your bone marrow, that's where they mature. B cells, bone marrow, T cells, thymus is where they mature. The bone marrow is where they make all of them, like all your blood cells. You can uh, order them at high end restaurants. Sweet breads. I think the thymus are pancreas. We don't eat a lot of organs in the US, but uh, we eat a lot of kidneys. We got a heart. But, uh, All right, you guys have been very patient, but I've been talking. It's like past my time. So let's take a little four minute break and uh, we'll continue with a spleen. So 1142. <laughs>
Right now. My COVID thing is just really brief. I mean, you guys, some of you like know all this. I mean, uh, it's all your intelligence, but uh, just thought I'd go over it. If you guys have any questions, you can uh, definitely ask me personally. Um, right. I hope next fall we have a normal lab. I have no idea. You guys have no idea. All right, let's talk spleen. So I told you about your spleen. I asked you what it did. Could you tell me what it does? You know, you only have one of them. It's uh, it's found in your uh, upper left hand quadrant, kind of behind your stomach up here. If it's really enlarged, you can even feel like below your rib cage. I can't feel mine, but your spleen, you have models. So it's like a big window for your blood. It is. So it's going to filter your blood, and it's filled with uh, 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 it's like a sponge, really. So the blood has to go through this complex little system of little like sinuses and little nooks and crannies. And actually any bad blood cells, any red blood cells that are like on their way out, they're really old, they'll get stuck and they'll burst and the macrophages will eat them up. So the spleen is a major place where you can get rid of old blood cells. And then, uh, you know, the heme, the iron, everything, the vein goes back into the liver and you can store all that, recycle all those parts. So the spleen is where you break down red blood cells. The spleen is where you filter your blood for bacteria and such, because the blood is not a good place, you know, that bacteria growing. Uh, when you dissect it, or when you got a deer, for those of you that are hunters, you know, and uh, it looks a lot like a liver. It's kind of uh, soft and squishy and dark, dark red. It's kind of like a strand, like a film on it. Um, yeah. And what can I say? Just like your lymph nodes that enlarge, your spleen can enlarge when you're, uh, you're sick. Uh, anatomically, when you open it up, it looks, again, it looks like a sponge, it drips blood like crazy. And you have right here, they're called white pulp and red pulp. And the red pulp is blood, it's easy to remember. It's all these blood passageways where the blood is filtered for things like that. And then the white pulp is going to be, a, it's actually the purple here, it's where the lymphocytes are going to be. So that's where you're surveilling your blood for invaders. Your spleen is going to help you fight infections, just like your lymph node does. But this takes care of your huge blood vessel that goes in here. And then your lymph nodes are filtering lymph, which is just like water. This filters blood. 
Also, I talked to that in the lab a long time ago, and this is a normal size screen. Yeah, look at that. And I remember we uh, cut it open at the chest first, and there was like an organ coming in here, and there's a lung with a push way up here. Like, this is a huge. You're probably anemic because this big ends up breaking off some of your other blood cells. And so, yeah, if you guys get mono or you're sick, your spleen enlarges. So they tell you not to have activities because if you burst the spleen, it's hard to fix it. Um, because, like I said, it's like fixing a sponge with saran wrap on it. It's hard to suture it. So they'll often just take the spleen out. Yeah, yeah so five yeah. weeks again. If you, it's quite often if you fall really hard, you can burst that spleen. It's filled with blood and has just a delicate capsule. So uh, again, it's hard to suture, so the options get rid of it. You can live without it. I had a girlfriend. Um, so this is a large, sorry, this is, I started thinking back a long time ago. Um, so the spleen, um, if you don't have a spleen, uh, you don't find infection in your blood as well. And so you're often on antibiotics, or, or not, she wasn't, we are not, but um, your blood looks more like this. It's got more garbage. All right, so you got messier blood. Yeah, the spleen usually cleans out. Not so much. So I just Yeah, and ruptures, you know, serious fall or a car accident, a lot of pressure. Cool. All right, I think about ready to move on here. So lymph nodes. I give you the anatomy of the lymph nodes, what they do, right? And the lymph nodes. The thymus, briefly, I talked about it. It's where T cells mature. It's huge when you're a fetus and a, a kid, but it gets smaller throughout life. And the spleen, big organ, just one of them up on the right, on the left hand side of pie, under your ribs, uh, in your stomach. And uh, that is going to filter your blood and it looks like a big lymph node of your blood. Any questions on that? Oh. These are just the big things. And then there's all kinds of diffuse lymphatic tissues. So throughout your whole body, especially where, where uh, pathogens can get in. So you have lots of this in your gut. Because your gut has tons of bacteria, in it, especially in your large intestine, right? So tons of lymphocytes underneath your gut, underneath your trait, your respiratory tract, your urogenital tract, your urethra, lots. Because those are places where things get in. There's lots of diffuse tissue. I'm talking about the ones that. Obvious, but uh, realize that it's called a malt, yeah, mucosa associated lymphoid tissue. So, mucosa would be like that mucosa in your urethra or uh, in your trachea with all those little cilia that's going to help move stuff out of there. You know, underneath it is all these lymphocytes. So, they're ready to sample uh, anything that's new and dangerous. And malt, it's malt, gut associated lymphatic tissue, malt, which is more general. Yep, good spots to intercept. Antigens are any substance that uh, is foreign, like the antigens on your blood cell, the A and B, anything that is a, a unique signature on it. So places like your, you absorb things in your gut and uh, underneath your, your, your post is a good place to find any unique stuff and they can share that information. Oh, this is a gorgeous slide though. This is a part of the small intestine. Just a part of it. And these big uh, purple circles there, and in the business, they're called Pyre's patches. But I won't ask you that. But these big circles are dark purple because they're lymphocytes. Remember that big nucleus is so purple? So that's where we're seeing this accumulation of these. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, awesome. All right, we'll talk tonsils and appendix. Uh, which are expendable, obviously. Many of you out there do not have a tonsils or a pendix or both. I got a both, but uh, maybe you had some of those removed. They used to remove the tonsils all the time, almost like kind of routine, but now they really hold back more when I was a kid because they do fight infection. So instead of just you know, ripping them out, um, they think about it anyway. But if a person has a, um, chronic tonsillitis, then it's probably best to get rid of them because they can almost close up your throat. But again, if a kid just has tonsillitis and it gets better, it's best to leave them because a lot of lymphocytes can help fight infection. So, in terms of uh, where your body, you know, 
major to get in is you know around your, your oral cavity in one place. And so there's this brain of lymphatic tissue called the prostate. Oh yeah, look at in there. These are swollen. These are these uh, huge tonsils. Uh, the back of your tongue is called the lingual tonsil. That's kind of cool. And the ones we normally think about are your palatine tonsils. You can see them in the mirror in the back of your throat, kind of patches. And the ones your pharyngeals are up here, kind of hidden. Those are your adenoids. You guys remember, I got my, my tonsils and my adenoids. The adenoids are up, uh, kind of hidden up above your ear. So yeah, there's some adenoids that are up here you can't quite see, and then here's the big uh, pharyngeal uh, palatine tonsils back there. Uh, let's take a look at it. Oh yeah, so you can see, but it's really your ring. These are the ones that go up here, like your tubes to your ears, right? But uh, back of your tongue, your normal tonsils, and palatine tonsils, and then your adenoids. Make a ring around there of um, lymphatic tissue, lymphocytes. So sampling for invaders. Oh, there's your adenoids showing where they are. See that they're, they're kind of hidden back there, but uh, those are often removed too. Uh, here's a picture, and we're starting to get a like, similarity, right? This looks like the spleen. You don't look like your appendix. See the dark purple? It's kind of a lighter center, like the germinal center. That's where these are the body. So, yep. Uh, usually in histology, we get like chunks of pee stuck in these little crevices because it comes from your tonsils in your mouth. You look at that and you see, okay, the dark purple with these little light circles, it's some kind of a lymphatic tissue. So that's why they, they can be removed, um, but uh, they sit there sampling and then they'll find pathogens early on and like alert everyone. So they're helpful for fighting infection. Just like this. Yeah, vermiform means worm like. So appendix, like in the book, is comes off the end, right? So, the appendix is this more like extension uh, on your uh, large intestine. And that's the same thing. It can be removed. Uh, but you see these uh, light centers, and these are filled with uh, lymphocytes. And um, of course, with appendicitis, is when this gets blocked off, the dead end sac. If it gets blocked off, this gets infected, it can swell. And that's what kills the Houdini got punched in the stomach, he didn't feel well that night, and then he was dead the next day. Let's talk about my stepbrothers. Well, my mom, I can never be sick. I always had to go to school. There's no excuses, right? And then um, my brother said, Oh, I got a tummy ache. He's like, Oh, I'm going to school. Turns out his appendix burst. He had to go to the hospital. I know. The guilt from my mom. Like, oh, you're okay. Oh, geez. And okay. the first appendix, and all that crap in there is going to get in your. Normally sterile peritoneal cavity, so that's not good at all. So, and next, we take appendicitis seriously. We can them all. In the lower right hand cor uh, corner, is going to be this little back there. And so, sure, you can remove it, but if you don't have to leave it, you can help other Well, there it is. Yeah. And of course, it's a very common uh, operation, so we know where to find it. It's like a little worm, vermiform appendix. And there's a hole right here. That can get blocked off with fecal material or no blood, and then this part can get infected. Oh, so here's our appendix. See this little piece, piece right here? It's just a vestige of what used to be a huge extension. Like if you look at a horse, a zebra, or whatever, it's huge. And it's a dead end like this, where um, if you eat um, grass and plant material, you gotta slow it down because only bacteria can really digest them. So they have this big dead end. The plant material can stay there and ferment. A cow does it in its stomach, but horse does it in its colon like this. We just have a little remnant of it, the appendix. People ask, well, what is it for? Well, if you look at the rest of the mammals, it's really big and no big long plants. We're omnivores, so we have a big one. I'll talk more about this. Yeah, koalas only eat lupus seeds. So they're really low nutrition, they need a really long. All right, so what's going to kill you? <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know. You can take a Facebook quiz. Maybe. I don't know. Um, cancer, cancer is your own cells. That's your own cells that are going kind of nuts and uh, dividing uncontrollably. That's one thing. So not, not everything is, a, is an infectious disease or a, a pathogen. Sometimes you can just go wrong, you know? Um, but the pathogens, disease-causing things, really fall into those first two categories that we're both confused about. So bacteria, 
all kinds, salmonella, all kinds of bacteria, and then viruses of course, like COVID, all kinds of viruses, COVID, all things like that. Um, and of course, we, I've, I've told you the difference between those. And then uh, antibiotics, you know, work for bacteria, but not for viruses. Uh, we don't have a lot of good antiviral drugs. So, you know, mostly a cold, you sit it out, you know, how much you can do about it. Yeah. And the reason why antibiotics work so well, I don't want to get into it too much, is that we are eukaryotes. You know, we're, we're this group, and bacteria are prokaryotes over here. So just like you can put a, a, a weed killer on your lawn, and it kills the dandelions, but it leaves the grass alone, because grass are monopods, and weeds are dicots. They're like two different things. So if you get a disease, I mean, a, a, some kind of toxin, some kind of poison, that only kills the um, how you make the cell wall bacteria, none of our cells make that same cell wall, then it's fine. You can wash your body with it, it kills only the bacteria that use your cells. That's just the basics of how we can take this toxin that's deadly, the bacteria can't make a cell wall. We don't make that stuff. It doesn't hurt us. So that's and then there are eukaryotes. Um, if you drink the water here, even in Maine, a beautiful mountain stream, you think, oh, it looks beautiful. You get Gerardia, and you get, there's still a little parasites that live in beavers and stuff like that. So, um, malaria, Gerardia, Gerardia, and then there's big worms, you get all kinds of other parasites. Mainly you think about sicknesses, you look at bacteria, viruses, and main antagonists. All right, so what can we do to prevent all these guys that would love to live inside of us? Oh my gosh. And they try hard all the time, constantly trying to get in. Well, innate, whenever you hear about innate, the question on the test, the innate response is going to be quick and non specific. Right? The adaptive takes time. I talked about, you know, weeks to make antibodies. So, innate, you're born with. So, everyone has that born. There's a, you're going to uh, have a response and you have an infection. Things like a fever, things like phagocytosis, uh, things like inflammation, or get bread, or histamine, and that kind of thing. So these things are all just innate, non specific. And um, yeah, the, the adaptive, you know, you get a prior exposure to it, be able to recognize a specific invader. The innate is just, hey, you're different, you're going to kill you. So skin, skin is beautiful. I'm broken skin, of course. If you have a cut, you know, like psoriasis and things, it's thought early in life that kind of cracking of a baby's skin allows them to have later in life had some other autoimmune type diseases. But the skin, unbroken skin, is a beautiful barrier. Um, it's not anything that has to get in, it has to go against the current, right? Your skin is moving outward, right? It divides from the bottom out. You have to swim against it. You're always like losing skin cells, and so you're getting rid of anything that's trying to get into you. Really hard for a lot of that. So, you know, you can shake someone's hand and have COVID all over your fingers and not get COVID, but if you touch your eyes, your mouth, you know, that's when you have uh, uh, places where it can get in. But most of your skin beautifully protects you from that. And then phagocytic cells, the main ones, make sure you know this, I can say they are going to be the neutrophils and the macrophages. These are the phagocytes. They eat. I mean, heat cells, heat cells. And so these are going to just find that bacteria and eat it. Find that virus and eat it. And then they digest it and destroy it. But it's not real specific. It's just general phagocytes. And then I'll show you a slide of inflammation, which I've already talked about. It gets red and warm and swollen and painful. That is a response to an infection. Not being specific, but any infection can cause inflammation. Your mucus, the mucus um, in your, uh, uh, think about your respiratory tract. Remember, it has those little cilia that are beating and make mucus. So, crap in your nose, your windpipe get trapped in that. Then, the acidity of your stomach, it's so acidic that a lot of pathogens have a hard time, some can, getting sick from eating things because the acid in the proteases will break down anything getting through there. And the vagina is acidic too. Maybe the lactic acid, you have know, acidic bacteria, but acidity, and your skin is salty too, like sweat is kind of salty. And you all know that bacteria is growing salt. That's why we saw the food before refrigeration. So saltiness, the acidity, mucus. Your tears have lysis on it, have an enzyme that breaks down and kills bacteria in your tears. And so 
things don't grow in your eye that well because all the tears are constantly making an enzyme to break that down. Yep. So these are all, when you hear any of these, think innate. Innate, you're born of it, it's not specific. All right, so the number one phagocyte is the neutrophils. It makes up 60, 70% of your white blood cells in your blood. And you have huge stores of these in your bone marrow. So man, you get an infection, you cut yourself and it gets infected on your finger or something, neutrophils are on their way. And they will eat the bacteria, they can eat like a dozen. Yeah, a dozen, and then they blow up, they die, turn to pots. So they're not that smart or that good, but there's lots of them, right? So it's like sending the army in general. It might be amazing. And when you find them in the blood, it makes up 70% you know, of your blood, blood cells. But then they're going to leave the blood to die after these. They're going to go into your tissues and they're going to fight the fight. Oh, yeah, this shows. Let's look at this filter here. You can see it's going to take them in the environments, right? Or a rusty nail or something like that, right? And uh, yeah, tetanus is really nasty because it uh, grows anaerobically. So if you get a deep, rusty nail, and now we have. We have, uh, you guys have tetanus shots, but tetanus is horrible. It will kill you. It makes, it makes you die a horrible death. So if you get tetanus, make sure you get tetanus shots. Um, but that bacteria will grow in there and start making toxins. But any kind of bacteria gets in there, and then uh, it's going to start dividing because the bacteria, there's food in there, it's warm, they love it, they start growing. And then um, the localized tissue is going to respond by giving off chemical signals that make the capillaries nearby expand. Make the blood flow better. The histamine and heparin can make local capillaries expand. There's more blood flow. Unfortunately, it makes your finger like swell up and it's kind of painful and swollen. But that's on purpose. If you dilate those blood vessels, so more neutrophils come. And then signals on the surface of that capillary are like little sticky notes, sticky um, or spike strips that will stop the neutrophils and say, dude, we need you here. And so neutrophils will leave the blood like crazy in a spot of an infection because their signals are weak and chemicals. And neutrophils by the thousands and billions will come out there to eat, they'll even leave, they can burst, they turn into pus. Um, if it's a real bad infection, you'll even make like a clotting and make like a, a fibrous kind of a capsule to kind of localize that infection. So your body does what it can to, to kill it off before it spreads. Because if you get a bacterial infection in your whole body, it's going to kind of kill you really quickly. You need to stop this quick. So there's you know, some bad infections that uh, spread. What do you think? Uh, positive feedback. More white blood cells. More white blood cells are more chemicals that affect more white blood cells. So it's kind of a positive effect. Uh, you want to keep it going until you destroy the invaders. Here's just another picture showing what's going on. You can see the neutrophils are leaving, leaving the bloodstream, and they're following the trail. So that's the line towards the infection. Whenever they find anything that they don't, they recognize as foreign, they will engulf it, digest it, kill it. My next lecture, I talk about cytokines. These are chemicals given off that are going to do several things that will trap more white blood cells. Ooh, look at that, even a little bit of like a kind of like I say walling off the infection. So you need some platelets uh, to make it fibrous. And eventually, a cut like this, just to show you some more skin, but you can see that uh, uh, here's the epidermis like coming out to, to, to repair itself. So it's going to repair itself, this little scalp will come off, and we'll be good as new. All right, fever. Whew. If you get an infection, if you have a fever, it's a sign you have an infection, right? What happens to your heart rate? Increases. So a fever um, used to be thought to be uh, an issue that needed to be controlled always. But now we know it's just a response by your body. So you like to let a fever run its course unless it gets dangerously high. Right? If your kid's like 103, 104, then you, you get them to the doctor, you put ice, you know, but uh, normally, you know, a slight elevated temperature means that your body is fighting off infection. You encourage that. You want to fight fever. Now, why 
why is it female? Well, it turns out a lot of pathogens are really designed for our body temperatures. When you have a fever, they don't divide as well. They're not as happy. So we do that to help make them uncomfortable. And then it also makes our, our immune response, it ramps it up a little bit. So fever helps our immune response, it hurts the bacteria. And it's been found a fever takes iron out of your blood. And it's going to store it into your liver and spleen. And bacteria love iron to help them reproduce. And so you're, all these things are just slowing it down while your neutrophils can clean up the mess. So a fever is going to help your body. It's going to hurt the interior of the eye. Interleukins are a class of a uh, 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 whole bunch of chemicals. There's a whole bunch of interleukins, but interleukin one causes a fever. Iron. Iron means like like fire. Like Irogenesis means making a fire. Uh, Interleukin two is um, so, I talked about a lot of innate responses. I ended up with fever. I talked about phagocytes, inflammation, all these things your body does, skin and mucus and acid, all will help, you know, that first line of defense. And so that's what we hope, that every day you walk around with all kinds of danger around you, that you hope that first line of defense works. And if the bacteria can't get through your skin, you live your life. But if they do get through your skin, the second line of defense will be those phagocytes, inflammation, fever, and then there's a third line of defense of a specific adaptive response where you make antibodies against it. You have to specifically recognize that invasion. So that'll be the subject of the last lecture. And uh, this adaptive response, we only see it as a recent evolutionary feature. So bugs and fish and like that, they can do these innate, but this adaptive is a cool thing that we have. Oh, I'm going to go out early. This, this is unheard of. All right, all right, you guys. Good luck. Email me any questions for the test, anything like that.